uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the different lands that we are connecting in from today and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm very excited to welcome you to our webinar today. The last time I listened to Dr. Brent James was when I was one of his students. Um, uh, on the advanced training programme at Intermountain. And I can always remember that when we saw he was on the programme, um, we all knew we were in for a stimulating and a thought provoking discussion. So I hope you're looking as forward as I am to hearing from him um, about recent trends and thinking around safety and value in healthcare. Without further ado, Farhana, I'm gonna hand over to you to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kari. Um, so my name is Farhana Nakuda, and I lead the Health Catalyst business for Asia Pacific, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, Dr. Brent James is known internationally for his work in clinical quality improvement, patient safety, and the infrastructure that underlies successful improvement efforts such as culture change, data systems, payment methods, and management roles. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and has participated in many of that organization's seminal works on quality and patient safety. Dr. James is a fellow of the American College of Physician Executives. He holds faculty appointments at several universities, Stanford University School of Medicine, Harvard School of Public Health, and the University of Utah. Throughout today's session, we encourage you to participate by submitting questions in the Zoom Q&A window, and also raise your hand if you would like to be unmuted to ask, answer a question. We'll also have a Q&A session after Dr. James' presentation, so please feel free to join in that discussion as well. With that, I'd like to hand over the mic to Dr. James. Thank you very much, Verona, and a special thanks to Kari. It's been too long, Kari, since I last saw you. You know, I spent a chunk of my life in Australia many, many years ago, mostly at uh, um, North Shore in, in Sydney teaching courses and working with uh, colleagues in your country. Uh, as I was preparing for this, I wondered if things are much the same or if they're really different. I, I hope you'll keep me honest today. Some of my assumptions may be out of date, um, but I think I understand what it was like to deliver care in Australia. I'm sure that things have changed um, and hopefully we'll have a very stimulating, fun, but very productive conversation I really hope to do a couple of things in the next hour before we open it up for general questions. Um, number one, um, I'd like to describe the clinical opportunity. It turns out that care could be dramatically better than it is now. We'll have to put that in very careful context in the following sense. It's easy to make the case that care delivery today is the best the world has ever seen. We routinely achieve miracles. But it's also the duty of any member of the healing professions to pass along something to the next generation better than we ourselves received. And the first step in doing that is to find areas where we fall short of our theoretic potential. Um, I'm going to label that clinical opportunity, clinical variation. Um, and I hope pre present a fairly comprehensive model. That's going to lead to a value proposition. Clinical variation drives waste in healthcare delivery, and it's fun to put some numbers on that real opportunity. Of course, the next key question, why does clinical variation exist? And how do you manage care to avoid it? That's going to lead to a, maybe the focal point of the whole conversation. I'm going to call it the tipping point for value. Um, we'll have to translate it a bit into an Australian setting. I'll tend to rely upon my own experience here in the United States, of course. I know we're different countries, different settings, different frameworks, pretty much the same medicine, best I can tell, um, as far as that goes. But we'll have to follow up on that fairly, fairly thoroughly. And finally, I'd like to recommend some small steps for picking targets um, for your consideration. Well, with that, let's just jump right into it. You know, for me, it all started many, many years ago. I moved to Salt Lake City in 1986. Um, it was a bit of a personal tragedy, frankly. Uh, I was uh, suddenly a single parent, quite unexpectedly. Just me and my three-year-old, I moved to Salt Lake to get closer to family. 
I was a classic academic physician. I didn't know that administration existed. I really didn't. Hey, when the resources were needed, they just magically appeared as they should. I was based in Boston at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute as a surgical oncologist. My real faculty appointment though was in biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health, an assistant professor there. When I showed up in Utah, oh, what a change. Um, I bumped into a fellow, his name was Steve Busboom, the vice president for finance. It was really Steve who had the idea. You see, he had somehow stumbled across the body of research that was outside of my experience. Uh, it was really epitomized, if you wanted a poster child, it was Jack Wenberg at Dartmouth, of Dartmouth Atlas fame. He had been studying variation in care delivery. Now, Jack's approach was geographic variation. He established 309 geographic areas within the United States, medical service areas, referral districts, basically. What he discovered is even after you corrected for the underlying patient factors, massive differences from place to place. In fact, the differences were so large that it was pretty much impossible that all patients could be getting good care, even with full access to care. Well, Busboom had seen this, but he wanted to push the question a level deeper, down to where most of us actually live every day. He said, I get it. There are different between geographic areas. Oh, by the way, Wenberg extended that across Canada and Europe. Um, it seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. But but what Busboom wanted to ask, I wonder if there's variation inside a single facility. The methodology we developed, I believe, um, this is really hard to prove, but I believe it's still the most rigorous ever performed. We call them quality utilization efficiency studies, a short version in a two-year time period. We studied these six clinical areas lifted, listed here at the top, starting with transurethral prostatectomy, gallbladder disease, artificial hip joints, bypass graft surgery, permanent pacemakers, community-acquired pneumonia. What we would do is we'd identify every patient who was treated with one of those conditions within a, a specific period of time, usually one year, we'd check to make sure the medicine hadn't changed. Then we would track individually severity of presenting disease for each patient, individually stage at every comorbid disease, individually stage every complication, long-term outcomes. And we were, to the limits of an observational design, able to create a cohort of patients that were, so far as we could tell, clinically identical, coming in and going out. And we argued in that setting, it was fair to say what happened in the middle. Was there variation in care? It was relatively expensive, frankly, um, mostly in a trained team of nurses that Steve gave me to extract data from patient charts. Oh. Steve had built one of the world's first activity-based costing systems, so we had a really accurate handle on cost, the best in all the world, frankly. But it wasn't beginning to address all of the clinical factors involved. A QUE study would have cost at the time fifty dollars to $100,000 in staff time to pull all of the data. Um, these days, it would be substantially more, of course, um, quite expensive. Well, what did we find? we found true staggering variation. In fact, the variation within a single facility, within a single hospital, was dramatically larger than what Wenberg was showing across geographic areas. Um, many years later, I served on a National Academy of Medicine Committee, Geographic Variation Committee, and we validated this finding. If you're really looking for variation, go right to the coal face, right where the, the work gets done, where clinicians interact with patients. This is just to illustrate the principle. This is transurethral prostatectomy. Uh, 16 high volume surgeons took the low volume guys, analyzed them separately. These are the people who did these cases, bread and butter, every day, mainline, statistically significant numbers of cases. Two factors the surgeons had identified as critical when performing this procedure, neither one bus booms, activity based costing system, of course. The little green squares show a true surgical cut time in the operating theater. You can find that quite accurately in the anesthesia notes, just in passing. The little red circles are really the purpose of the procedure. It's grams of prostatic tissue removed. So just to give you a sense of the variation, in terms of true surgical procedure time, physicians H and F, 90 minutes to do a standard procedure on a standard patient. Um, the low is physician K, 38 minutes. 
That's a two and a half fold difference, 250 percent multiplicative difference. In terms of grams of tissue, it goes from a low of 13 grams to a high of 42. That's a threefold, 300 percent difference. The crazy thing, as a surgeon, it just flummoxed me. You can see it in the graph. It's it's quite evident just in the graph. Very strong statistical result. The longer you operate, the less tissue you remove. Oh, it went a step deeper. It was Hal Bourne, Dr. Hal Bourne, the chief of urology on our major teaching hospital urology service. We were tracking a long-term treatment failure. We, of course, did this procedure for people with urinary output obstruction. Some reobstructed. The research definition at the time was reoperation within one year. We were tracking that major treatment failure. Hal had found a fairly obscure article in the urology literature that linked that failure to grams per minute. It was his idea to lay out the data this way, but we validated that finding. You're actually looking at a clinical outcome indirectly. That major complication treatment failure concentrated in these surgeons to the right. Now, truth is, we eventually tracked it down. Turns out it's a difference in surgical technique and eliminated it and showed a dramatic improvement in clinical outcomes. Oh, bus boom, the finance officer, this was his favorite slide. Remember that activity-based costing system? We could very accurately measure cost of care. A few years ago, of course, these costs are much higher today. Take a look at the differences, though. Physician M, 1,164 hospital dollars to get a good outcome on a standard case. Physician H was high, 2,233. Twice as much. Same patient, best we could tell. Same outcome. Twice as much resource. Now, a couple of other very, very key findings. What I showed you in those slides, they're actually summary slides. Um, this one particularly, summarizing about 45 cost-related factors. We'll break them out. If you break out the detail, you'll find the most interesting thing. There was never a single instance where one clinician was consistently bad or consistently good. Well, let me say that more precisely. Consistently high or consistently low. This physician, M, who was so low, yeah, on average, he was a very efficient physician. Trouble was, for two or three of the things we were tracking, he was the highest in the group. H looked pretty inefficient. Trouble was, for a couple of things, he was the best in the group. And if you looked at the detailed data for any period of time at all, you realized the best care for a patient was almost certainly scattered across the group. This principle, uh, Maureen Bizignano at IHI eventually came to call all teach, all learn. We discovered that everyone had something they could contribute and some ways that they could improve their care. And of course, it forced us in a particular direction. It wasn't a matter of choosing the best or the worst in terms of the clinicians involved. It was a matter of identifying the best care as a team, as a group. And we were able to successfully do that and show dramatic differences in outcome for all six of those areas that I showed just now. It led to big change. Oh, before I leave these slides, I should mention one other thing. Variation in nursing practices were at least as large. This is not just physicians. In fact, the largest rate of variation I've ever personally measured in a career of doing that is physical therapy. <laughs> it made the rest of us look like pikers in terms of our ability to vary. It turns out this sort of variation is endemic across all of the healing professions. Now, this has some important implications, I would argue to you. Uh, one way of describing it to you, back in, nine, I'm sorry, 2009, it was the run-up to the Affordable Care Act here in the United States, Obamacare. I was asked to testify four times to various congressional committees. Now, the big dog here in the United States, the Committee of Record for Health Policy, the Senate Finance Committee, testified twice there. What I was trying to do was take a very complex literature, a truly extensive literature. If you did a Medline search looking for articles in the peer-reviewed medical literature documenting variation in care, it rolled out more than 40,000 articles amazingly consistent with findings in every aspect of care. I was trying to reduce it to a form that intelligent lay people presumably could easily understand. And this was my attempt to do that. I broke it into a series of subcategories. When I say clinical variation, this is what I mean 
at a detailed level. Oh, let's just frame this again because it's going to be a little pejorative. We have to remember, care delivery today is the best the world has ever seen. That's an easy, trivial case to make. We routinely achieve dramatic results for most people. We do an awful lot of good. That's why I've labeled the slide the way that I have. It's where care falls short of its theoretic potential. It's opportunities for better. We've already talked about the first, massive variation in clinical practice, to the point where it's pretty much physically impossible. All people are getting good care, even with full access to care. Number two, has, excuse me, <clears throat> number two on the list, misdiagnosis. You know that about 10 to 20% of initial diagnoses are incorrect. That means treatment misadventures. We start down the wrong path. Many of the treatments we use, it's not just that they don't benefit, they can actively harm, and of course it's wasteful at the same time. Number three is even more challenging. You know, it started with Bob Brook at Rand in Los Angeles. They were looking at Wenberg's variation data up here in number one, and Brooke et al., many other researchers at many other universities said, maybe we can explain geographic variation through something called inappropriate care. Care was judged inappropriate if the risk inherent in a treatment outweighed any potential benefit to the patient. This is a profession that holds as our primary maxim, first, do no harm. These would be areas where we put patients actively in harm's way things we shouldn't do. They developed formal methods for doing that. Two major conclusions from that set of studies. Uh, number one, it turns out that inappropriate care does not explain geographic variation. Go to a low utilization community around a particular treatment or, or procedure, compare it to a high utilization community, assess the amount of inappropriate care in each community. On average, they were about the same. But then a secondary finding, much more deeply troubling, in that first set of studies, the high watermark was carotid and arterectomy. 32% of all procedures performed judged to be clinically inappropriate on careful review by one's professional peers. Should never have been done. More risk in the treatment than the patient had any potential benefit. It gets worse. Some years later, the COURAGE trial in cardiovascular medicine said that over half of all cardiac stenting is clinically inappropriate. The benefits don't outweigh the risks. That, just in passing, about six months ago, that study was updated in the Journal of the American Medical Association with very similar results. It hasn't gone away in the intervening years. I have a friend, um, Gary Kaplan. He's an internist and the CEO of Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle. He's a center of excellence, um, especially for large companies like Walmart in the northwestern United States. So if a Walmart employer or family member that's insured through their, their employment has a need for back surgery, they put you on an airplane and fly you to Seattle, and Gary's program does it. Now, remember, these are people who were targeted for surgery in their local communities, on track to go to the hospital and get back surgery. Gary is turning about 55% back right now. He initially, his team does a very careful appropriateness analysis and says, what is best therapy? More than half he directs to medical care with really good results. He's saying that over half of all back surgeries is not correctly done. So this idea of inappropriate care, oh, yeah, if you think that number one and number two were troubling, number three much more so. Number four on the list you're already associated with, too. You already understand, I think, of November 30th, 1999, um, over 20 years ago. Institute of Medicine's Committee on Quality of Healthcare in America publishes a report called To Air is Human. Um, we estimated that somewhere between 44,000, 98,000 Americans die each year in hospitals where the cause of death is not their underlying disease. But the treatments we use to address those diseases in a way that two independent physician reviewers agreed were avoidable. Oh, I was in Sydney when Ross Wilson and his colleagues released the Australian medical practice study showing similar results. I need to say that about the whole list, by the way. Um, at least in my experience, most of the research I'm familiar with happens here in the United States. We tend to invest much more heavily in research. But I have sufficient evidence from around the free world to say that these happen in every country at fairly comparable rates. I've been in Australian hospitals. Despite Ross's study suggested that injury rates were higher, I just didn't believe that. 
And in fact, later, we brought Ross and Bertie Harrison particularly over to the United States to help redo some of our studies here. And sure enough, we were missing a large number of actual injuries. The true mortality rate in the United States is about 210,000 preventable deaths per year. It's just the craziest thing. It means that hospitals are somewhere between the second and fourth most common cause of preventable death in the United States. And, and this one has karmic balance. You've got to love this one. The idea of a hospital as a major public health problem, because technically we are. Well, that's number four on my list. Number five, it was Beth McGuinn. Initially it ran, now she's part of Kaiser Permanente, based out of Oakland, California. She kind of flipped it. We call number four care associated injuries, patient safety, we call those injuries of commission where the care actively harmed. Beth flipped it to injuries of omission. She said, you know, in a number of areas, we have things that we know for a fact work, things that are proven to benefit patients. Well, okay, if we have something we know works, how well do we execute? How reliably can we deliver that to patients with appropriate need? Short version. She showed that for adults, we managed to do it correctly about 55% of the time, for children, 46% of the time. So the way to think about number five on the list is this idea of reliable, high, highly reliable care. If we can achieve miracles doing it correctly roughly half the time, as we demonstrably do, what kind of miracles could we achieve if we did it correctly all the time? Something close to 100%. It means we're leaving an awful lot of lives and pain and suffering on the table. See the idea? Now, a funny thing happens when you look at care this way and shift your hat to the administrative side. Ed Deming first defined it. He had something called quality-associated waste. It applies specifically if you improve the quality of your clinical outcomes, it causes your cost of operations to fall. Turns out this idea of quality-associated waste is extremely strong concept, extremely high leverage. In fact, just to put a handle on it, we're going to come back to that fairly heavily in a few minutes. IOM report, another one, 2010 for this one, so 11 years ago. We called together the experts, reviewed the evidence. Our soundbite conclusion, a minimum of 30% and probably over 50%. Of all money spent on healthcare delivery is quality associated waste. What would it mean in Australia if the cost of healthcare fell by 50%? What would it mean to the people? What would it mean to the governments? What would it mean for your future? And the way that we took that waste out of the system was by providing better care, not by withholding care. That's why this is such a potent, important idea. Yeah, quality is job one, that if care is too expensive, it limits access. It limits the amount of good that we can do. And as we address this issue, we can deliver better care to many more people. That's the fundamental idea behind it. We'll come back to that again. Now, the next thing in our list, we know why this happens. <laughs> The same body of evidence uh, built up over the last 30 years points to really three factors. The first is just plain old complexity. Think of it as the fruits of 100, 110 years of clinical science. Right around 1910, the allopathic healing professions adopted the scientific method as the basis for how we know what we know. And wow, has that ever borne fruit? It's given us thousands of ways to intervene to change a patient's future dramatic shift in the nature of our professions and the good that we routinely achieve. Yeah, the trouble is, is at the same time we're shifting the ground under our feet. We'll come back to this very, very briefly. David Eddy, who is the intellectual father of evidence-based medicine, the first person in the field to use the term, the complexity of modern medicine exceeds the capacity of the unaided expert mind. And I'd like to just briefly review that in a few minutes. Well, complexity, it came up against a particular way of, of structuring the delivery of care. It's called the craft of medicine. It's the ethical framework within which physicians, nurses, pharmacists, therapists operate. It goes something like this. Um, I'm an expert. I've, I've got proper medical credentials. They take all of that knowledge and load it into this magic tool, the trained expert mind. 
I get it from formal education, from treatment experience. Of course, I stay current within my field. Well, honoring a fiduciary trust to put my patient before any other end goal. That's the first thing. Then drawing on that massive knowledge base, I see patients one at a time. That's why we call it a cottage industry. Then as a master craftsman, I craft a unique diagnostic and therapeutic experience for each patient. And the promise we made as a profession is that this particular approach guarantees each patient the best possible medical result. That's what we mean when we say craft of medicine. It's a way of deploying good care. Well, as you might expect, what happened when we started to study clinical variation? What did that evidence teach us about this idea of the craft of medicine and its ability to produce ideal care? Now, the fact is there was a point in time when craft of medicine was a real solution that achieved wonderful gains. It's not that we want to throw out this baby with the bath water. We need to to keep that idea of personal excellence. It's just that as care became dramatically more complex, it demands new approaches. It's a fundamental idea. The last bit on this, it has to do with something called clinical transparency. We studied it twice at Institute of Medicine. It's poor data linking clinical choices to patient outcomes as seen within routine practice. As seen as a clinician counsels with a patient choosing between different treatment options. When I say transparency, that's what I really mean. And frankly, our ability to supply that transparency in routine care to settings is quite limited still. Our electronic medical records still fall far short of the need. Well, yeah, just an idea moving ahead. We're going to propose change strategies for how you can make care better. If you get the causes wrong, if you get the diagnosis wrong, you're not going to succeed. Change strategies that fail to address these root causes, they routinely perform suboptimally or fail entirely. Usually they just fail entirely. Well, with that, craft of medicine we've talked about a bit. It goes a step further, and this is going to turn out to be important. This is a fellow named Larry Weed. He was at Case Western Reserve for most of his career. He invented the problem-oriented medical record. He spent a career understanding how clinicians, physicians, nurses, extract information about a patient, extract information from the medical literature, and use it to apply best treatment. And he gave us tools to help with that. So if you use soap notes or the problem-oriented medical record, as we all do, you can thank Larry. It's because Larry said it, that it makes so much sense. Until now, he said, we believe that the best way to transmit knowledge, this massive medical knowledge base, from its source in the evidence-based literature to its use in patient care, is to first load that knowledge into human minds. Those experts, the physicians and nurses, and then expect those minds at great expense to properly apply the knowledge to those who need it. However, he went on to say, there are huge voltage drops along this transmission line for medical knowledge. True thing was never said. And in fact, we have a, a very robust evidence base showing exactly that. I'll call it clinical uncertainty. I'm going to brush through it. I wish I had time. I kind of like this. And it's fun to dig through the complexity challenge. The number one, lack of valid clinical knowledge. I've built over 125 evidence-based best practice guidelines in my career. Uh, there is a, a more reliable source, an anecdote for what I'm about to say. We could find evidence for best practice about oh, 15 to 25% of the time on average in building those guidelines. When I say evidence, I love it if I get level one evidence, randomized controlled trials. I'm quite happy if I get strong observational designs, level two evidence, case control studies, case series, plaza experiments. I'll even settle for level three evidence, expert consensus opinion in a published form. When I say 20 to 25% roughly, that's accepting all three levels of evidence. Um, a problem. Physicians and nurses can hold legitimate differences of opinion about what's best because there is literally no evidence for many of the decisions we make in daily practice. A, a surprising parallel problem is the rate of increase of new medical knowledge. Short version, it's doubling about every three to five years. And what the evidence base shows is it's basically physically impossible for any clinician, physician, nurse, pharmacist to stay current. Um, it's both from a theoretic standpoint um, and from a empiric measures of how well people are still mastering the knowledge base when they're in the middle of their careers. 
think of it though, if that doubling time is roughly correct, it means that a new internist coming into practice is going to have to learn and unlearn and relearn half of her medical knowledge base more than five times. How do you do that when your days are full of patient care? Turns out we don't. Number three on the list, another real favorite, we tend to rely upon subjective recall. Now, early on, that worked. It turns out the expert human mind is a pattern matcher. We're doing diagnosis, well, except for that 10 to 20% misdiagnosis rate, we're, we do surprisingly well. The trouble is, is as the evidence base expanded, more and more the problem shifted from one of pattern matching to one of estimating rates. And what we know is, is we're kind of magical when we're pattern matching, but when it comes to estimating rates, we fail miserably. I don't care how smart you are or how well trained you are. The human mind is not well built to estimate a rate across a group over time. We do something called anchoring, where we're dominated by two or three recent events that we happen to recall, or if we have a particularly dramatic event in our deep past, good or bad, that becomes our lifetime experience. Again, this has been well studied. Um, we fail miserably. Now, in fairness to the clinicians, the ground was shifting. Early on, when we first used the craft of medicine so effectively, it mostly was pattern matching. But you think about it. Well, I did it a little while ago. I had a breast cancer case that I was asked to consult on. A 55-year-old woman with, unfortunately, stage 3 disease but I was keeping track. We went through four decision nodes. At each of those decision nodes, she had between two and four treatment choices. Some of them were truly life differences. I mean, this could be live or die sorts of choices. But I was keeping track. Well, Dr. James, if I choose this over this, what's the chance I'll die? That's a, that's a rate. That's a probability question. Well, Dr. James, these complications you're talking about, what are the chances that that'll happen to me? That's a rate. In fact, almost our entire conversation was about rates, about probabilities. It's funny because I have a degree in statistics. I've spent a career doing that kind of work, and it's still hard. The last one on my list, just pure raw complexity. It turns out it's in the Ed Psych literature. The root article is a guy named Miller in 1956. He asked the question, how many factors can the expert mind consider at one time when making a clinical decision? The answer is in this title, the magic number seven plus or minus two. We're actually studying ventilator management for acute respiratory distress syndrome, almost a precursor to COVID treatment, frankly. Uh, that's an ARDS model too. Turns out there are about 40 physiologic factors, unique physiologic factors you should consider. 40 is more than nine. In fact, we could explain the dramatic variation in ventilator settings we were seeing across a group of very respected academic intensivists. Uh, we, we'd work it backwards, and you could figure out which six or seven or eight factors those intensivists had selected in setting the ventilator, working it backwards. And it's just that every time they saw the patient, it appeared that they were selecting a different set, apparently at random. See the problem? I said it earlier. I'll say it again. Eddie was at Stanford when he first used the term evidence-based medicine in the medical literature. Of course, people like Sackett, David Sackett, a Canadian physician working in London, popularized it broadly, which may be a more important contribution, frankly. But Eddie really developed most of our formal methods, and he said it very, very well. The complexity of modern medicine, he said, exceeds the capacity of the unaided expert mind. That's the primary source of clinical variation, as best we can tell. It also implies that today, knowing what we know, sole reliance on the craft of medicine as the basis for clinical practice is completely scientifically untenable, indefensible from a careful scientific standpoint. Well, with that, we've found proven solutions. I need to say one thing in passing because it's going to pop up. It's the same thing that Larry Weed said. We compound the problem. We develop evidence-based best practice guidelines, but we rely upon a craft of medicine deployment strategy. We try to train people in the guideline. We try to load it into the human mind through academic detailing grand rounds, articles, published guidelines. Then we expect people to apply it correctly from memory. You need to know that that does not work. 
has been well studied. It simply does not work. It fails to address the core problem behind complexity. This idea that it exceeds the capacity of the expert mind. Well, yeah, we found proven solutions. It has to do with a very fun idea. The idea has been used in medicine for many, many years. Uh, John Eisenberg, who headed up AHRQ, chief physician at George Washington University Hospital, tracks examples back more than 200 years called mass customization. So two ways that humans have ever come up with to manage complexity. The first is, well, it's the analytic method. You have a problem that's too big to solve. Break it into a series of small problems. Find a solution for each of the small problems. You've just solved the big problem. It's also called reductionism, divide and conquer. Aristotle wrote about it. First remaining writing about it comes from Aristotle. Within medicine, of course, it leads to an old show because you subspecialize, you know more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. Now, it has a limitation. A human is more than the sum of their subcomponent parts. It's the interactions are critical. That's why we know today that a medical home that coordinates all of those systems is critically important to good outcomes. Well, it turns out there's an alternative method. They're complementary. They work really well together, frankly. It's based around a seeming oxymoron, the key to effective variation is standardization. The technical name for it in quality theory is mass customization. So here's how it works. You deploy standard work. It makes it really easy to do it right. But then your specific purpose of having the standard work is so that you can vary based on individual patient need. What you're doing is taking a very complex whole patient approach um, well, when we measured it, you need to vary about 5 to 15% of the time, 95% confidence interval. Uh, but it means 85, 95% of the time you can rely upon the standard work. What does that mean? It means I take my most important resource, the trained expert mind, and focus it on that relatively narrow band, the 5 to 15% that really makes a difference, where I need that kind of, of expertise. See the idea? But the only way you can pull it off is by standardizing the rest of the process so that I don't have to, to bird dog it, that I don't have to keep track of every little detail. Again, it's the story of clinical practice for the last 100 years. We've done it routinely. The lean guys put a fancy name on it and tried to sell it to us as a consulting service. But it's been around in medicine for a long, long time. We've just called it out, put a name on it, and started to use it as an explicit tool. works a little bit better that way. Can I just show you an example of what it looks like really quickly? Yeah, this idea of mass customization. It was a big randomized control trial way back in 1991. It's the first time I saw it. It was for acute respiratory distress syndrome. We were looking at a new Italian artificial lung, very highly intervention, highly, um, um, let's just say it was invasive <laughs> intervention. But we were looking at our control on a ventilator setting. That's where we found all that variation, of course, deadly to a trial. If you don't deliver your care in a consistent way, you can't link cause to outcome. All right? You can't causally link the treatments we were using to the outcomes we were achieving. We knew that we needed a protocol. So we set out to build a protocol for the control arm. That's where we first carefully examined the evidence base. And wow, a surprise. Certainly for ventilator settings, we have as strong evidence as you can ever find in all of medicine. About 20% of the key Elements that we'd identified were available to the literature. That's at a level three evidentiary standard, about 20%. But we had an answer. We'll generate our own level three evidence, expert consensus opinion to drive the guideline. We then discovered the problems with that, being careful. We had lack of evidence for best practices I've just mentioned. Trouble is, is expert consensus is unreliable. Eddie showed it. Um, we came to really, really distrust expert consensus as a means to identifying best practice. And, and, and this is a scientific truth. If we had the time, it's great fun to dig through it. We also knew that guidelines didn't guide practice. This old idea of human memory is an execution mechanism. Um, that's been well studied. Um, and it shows that, well, the clinicians will say it was very valuable training. They really learned a lot from ground rounds. They'll tell you they changed their practice. It all falls apart when you measure whether they changed practice. Study after study after study consistently showed no change in practice. 
This last one on my list, though, I think is the very most important. Um, having done it many, many times, oh, you understand this if you've ever practiced. No two humans are exactly the same. Um, the form it took for us, I, I don't think you can write a guideline that perfectly fits any patient. I'll show you the source of that in just a minute. Well, what we did then was deploy this using a form of lean, this idea of mass customization, strong form of lean. Um, I wanted to show you what happened. Um, we built this evidence-based best practice guideline for ventilator management of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, to this day, it's probably the finest evidence-based best practice guideline I've seen in my life, but about 80% of it was based on expert consensus. Dr. Alan Morris, the principal investigator on the trial, did it right. He took almost a year to build that guideline. He involved colleagues across the United States and from Europe, including the Italians, with their new artificial lung, extremely thorough. I mean, it had over 840 specific recommendations on how you set a ventilator based upon a patient's physiologic um, uh, parameters. But then knowing what we knew about guidelines, he used it in a really clever way. This is where it became lean. It's called a lean learning loop. He said to the physicians and nurses, he said, folks, please follow the guideline, but if you ever have, have a circumstance where you think it's just not right for this patient, you can override it on a whim. You don't have to justify yourself. Just do what's right for the patient. But they didn't stop there. Anytime somebody varied, they recorded that there was a variance and followed up on it. This shows guideline compliance when they first started to do this. In the context of that big randomized controlled trial, they first tried it on patient number 29 in the series of ventilated ARDS patients they were tracking. On that first patient, they followed guideline recommendations 41% of the time. More than half the time, they varied. Across the next four months, next eight patients, they went up over 90% compliance. Oh, the key thing you need to hear. In that time, they put more than 125 changes into the guideline. Now, oh, that's interesting. I said earlier, still to this day, it's probably the finest evidence-based best practice guideline I've seen in my life. That, how to say it, theoretic document changed wholesale when it hit patient care reality down at the front lines with a mechanism to track how well it was functioning and then adapt it to reality. Now, just in passing, we did more than 125 of these. This happened every time. Without failure, this shift is so common. When you're using guidelines in this way for standard work, you must have a formal, consistent method to tune the theory to the reality. This idea of a lean learning loop, this feedback loop, happens every time. If you do it well, you also get data validating the guideline, showing how it actually works. Just out of curiosity, of the guidelines you use, how many have validation data? In my experience, almost none. In fact, the only ones that really had validation data are the ones that I built myself and used that method, you see, just as a thought along the way. A key element in good care. Well, the results of the trial using the guideline as described, survival for ECMO entry criteria patients improved from 9.5% to 44%. We saw a dramatic improvement and clinical outcomes, mortality rates. Uh, first time since ARDS was defined as a syndrome back in the 60s that anyone had shown an improvement in outcome. And it was associated with that mass customization approach. By that point, we expected the cost to fall. That link between quality and cost is quite strong. Physician time fell by about 50%. It means that as a physician, you could concentrate on the things that mattered. Now, we put a name to this thing and started to use it broadly. We call them shared baseline protocols, a strong form of lean. Now, some groups call them bundles. What do you do? Just in very brief summary, you identify a high priority clinical process, something called fee process analysis. You build that evidence-based best practice guideline around it. It'll always be imperfect. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's just priming the pump for what comes next. You'll have very poor evidence. You'll have unreliable consensus. Do it anyway. You're just looking for a starting point. Here are the big, heavy, hard steps. You blend it into clinical workflows. It's called clinical decision support so that you don't rely on human memory. Basically, doctor, call it in. Don't bother to show up. Just let it happen. 
you're going to get evidence-based best care because you've built it into the process, into the workflow. It's the default state unless somebody intervenes. Uh, if you do it well, it will not burden the frontline teams. It will actually make care a little bit, bit easier. This is probably the hardest step is doing that well. Oh, side by side with it, you build in a data system right into that frontline workflow. So it's not just the clinical decision support going into the workflow. At the same point, you're capturing the data you need. It will be two kinds of data. Number one, you need to know anytime somebody varies from protocol. Uh, one of the most common tools is a standing order set. If you cross out an order on the order set, you're free to do that. But it's a protocol variation. You flag it. If you add an order, it's a protocol variation. You flag it. Second most common is something called a clinical flow sheet. If it says next, we should go here and do this. And you say, no, nope, not today. Not for this patient. We need to go there and do that instead. You're free to do that. But you flag it as a clinical variation. So you build in a fully integrated data system. What I'm talking about is an underlying analytics framework. It's absolutely essential for being able to do this well. Step five is the fun one. The way I used to say it to my colleagues here in Utah, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just that we allow or even that we encourage. We demand that you vary from protocol based on individual patient needs. I have strong evidence that we can't write guidelines that perfectly fit any patient. But that's why we have you. I need a thinking mind at the interface. Somebody can actually practice medicine, practice nursing. A wise judge to choose what really happens at that level. Oh, you'll get as much scrutiny for complying with one of our guidelines too much compared to your peers as for complying too little. That's literally true. I can show you specific examples. And then, of course, you build that feedback loop to tune the guideline to reality. Because you have the data system, you end up with a guideline that now is fully validated in terms of exactly how it functions, exactly what it produces. It's the foundation for what's called the learning healthcare system, if you're interested in that little bit of quality theory in recent years. Well, a couple of lessons pulled from this. Lesson number one, we count our successes in lives. I mentioned that I had more than 100 of these, about 125. I could document more than 2,000 lives per year here in Utah, about 3 million total population. 2,000 lives per year, people who in the past would have died who didn't today. And, and you understand that mortality is kind of the tip of the iceberg, dramatically bigger impact in terms of well function restored, suffering averted. But that's the first thing I want you to know. The evidence is, is reasonable. We could be much better for our patients in their hour of need. For no other reason, this is why we should pursue this. We could do so much better for those who need our help. And the evidence is fairly overwhelming about that. It will require some change, but it's worthy change. Um, it has to do with our core purpose as healing professionals. Number two, just a little illustration. We published this in JAMA in 2016. It was a third-generation patient center medical home in and outpatient setting. Gen 1, we deployed shared baseline guidelines into primary care around major chronic diseases like heart failure or type 2 diabetes, mellitus, hypertension. Gen 2, we added, well, mental health integration, treating most mental health problems, especially depression as chronic diseases in an outpatient setting. Gen 3, care coordinators to coordinate a full set of community resources for each patient. Then we ran a trial, about 150,000 patients in the trial. This was a commercial age population, so it avoided most of the truly elderly. It was uh, between about oh, 20 and 65 year old people. Um, if you care to read the article, you'll see the clinical outcomes improved. My purpose here though, is to talk about the associated money waste technically. Well, you can see the waste drivers. In the context of the trial, when we used that third generation patient center medical home, team based care, hospitalization rate fell by 22%. Visits to specialists, outpatient procedures by 21%. ED visits, 11%. We'd much rather that patients go to our walk in primary care, urgent cares. Not surprisingly, the cost of care, the number of visits to primary care went up somewhat. 
Um, I've included imaging, 11% drop. I forgot to put lab on the slide when I first created it. I think it was a 12 or 13% drop. I'll just roll it together. It turns out it costs us about $22 per person per year to deploy this. Uh, now, I'm going to come back to this idea. Quality is not free. It always takes an investment. That $22 is probably a bit high. The real number was about $16 to $18, but in the paper we were being conservative. Oh, our total medical expense fell by $115 per person per year, primarily because of reductions in hospitalization rate, ED rates, visits to specialists. We saw a dramatic reduction in cost of care, uh, frankly, some tens of millions of dollars per year to our system in terms of better financial performance. In fact, if we just put a handle on it, this was not just team-based care, but a number of other projects, this black line well, the, the blue line shows our expected growth. The population was growing. We had a demographic shift as people aged. This was a conservative expected total expenditure for the populations we served. We set a goal to limit the growth of health care costs to consumer price index inflation plus 1%. That's the black line. Uh, this shows the actual data across four years from 2012 through 2015. We actually achieved our goal of a 13% reduction in total cost of care one year early. We took about, well, $700 million out of the cost of operation of our system through quality improvement. Why do I show you that? I want you to know that this is real. I didn't do that analysis, by the way. Our finance department did. So, so it meant that they actually believed that it was trustworthy. It was real money, real dollars that we could then return to patients this lower health care costs and easier access to care. It still continues to this day. It does work, and it works on a large scale. That's one of the things I really wanted to share with you to show you today. Well, in that context, lesson number two, nearly always better care is cheaper care. Said another way, if you're struggling with the cost of care in Australia, if that continues to be devil you like it does all the rest of the world, the key message is this, the path to financial success leads to clinical excellence. If you do it right, better care is nearly always cheaper care. There'll be some exceptions to the rule, but they'll be dominated by these other factors. Now, truth be told, I play in that sandbox of estimating waste in health care. The IOM reports at a minimum of 30%, probably over 50%. I get about 65% waste but I model it, um, and I recommend that method to you, <laughs> needless to say, I kind of like it. Um, it's my model after all. Well, here's the point. It's 10 to 100 times greater than any other opportunity for solving healthcare cost problems that I've ever encountered in any setting. My advice is just follow the money. That idea of quality-associated waste dominates the financial conversation, if it is properly understood and applied, and it's worth the effort to understand it and apply it. It goes a step further. It's not just that the pot of money is so big. It always takes an investment. Anytime you're investing in changing health care, you'd really like to know what you're getting. At least here in the United States, we make a, a number of those investments traditionally have. We think of it as revenue growth. If I get my money back plus a 5 to 9% contribution to operating margins to keep my institution, my practice alive, that's considered to be a dramatic success. Well, wait a minute. That little example I just showed you of team-based care, that was a 5 to 1, a 500% contribution. Uh, typically, you'll see a minimum of about a 50% contribution to well over 100%. It's not just that the total pot of money is 10 to 100 times bigger. Your return on investment as you initiate contract change is similarly 10 to 100 times bigger. From a purely financial perspective, you should be focusing on clinical excellence, properly applied, following all the way through, making it work. Now, it is an analytics problem. You'll need really good analytics support to make it happen. In fact, Kari Mar came to the ATP, we talked about the preliminaries of this, Corey, it's moved much further and it turns out that it's still true. If anything, it's working much more dramatically than back when you came through the ATP. Um, 
He called the right shot on that one for sure. Well, let's just follow it a step further. Um, yeah, from a purely financial perspective, quality associated waste should be your primary focus. Much larger total financial opportunity, much higher return on investment. But there's a key question involved. It's lesson three. Who makes that investment? Turns out it's always the care delivery group. It's a clinical change. And then the real question is, who gets the savings? Now, I'm going to use the U.S. version of this. The truth is I've lived the same thing in Canada and to some degree in Australia in the past. So I understand how it happens under government-funded care with a fixed budget. And we could discuss that if you'd like in the question and answer period. The principles remain the same. Here's my actual waste model. It actually is a tiered model of waste. The things up at the top are called population health. or social determinants of health fit into it quite nicely. So it's truly universal. It picks up all the other models. It's tiered so you can estimate waste correctly. Um, this is population level health where you avoid inappropriate cases. You do no more cases than you should. This level is clinical variation and patient safety within a practice. And finally, it's a supply chain and administrative efficiency is just how much you're spending for what's called the unit of care. Well, the reason I really like it, it links directly to payment mechanisms. This is an article that we published in of all crazy places, the Harvard Business Review a few years ago. Um, it shows those levels of ways versus three ways of getting paid. And I believe the last I was there, you have some versions of all of this in Australia. Fee for service, where you're paid for a specific service one at a time, per case payments or DRGs. Provider at risk, uh, the most high-end form of that is capitation. They're sometimes called shared risk models. There are seven or eight different forms of it. Well, well here's the point. Uh, it has to do with who makes the investment, the care provider group, and who gets the savings. A red down triangle means the care provider group makes the investment, but all of the savings go back to the payer, to government, or to a private insurance company, leaving the care provider group holding the bag for the expense of the project. Sometimes it does permanent damage to their financial structures moving ahead. In fact, those red down triangles are a fast way to financial catastrophe through clinical improvement. The green up triangles show where you get financial alignment. That means that all or at least some of the waste savings generated by an effective clinical change come back to the group who made the investment. You'll notice that there's only one that's all green. Um, it's provider at risk in some form or another. There are different forms of it. I've just laid out the whole financial argument to you for value-based care in its simplest form. This is what it really represents. Now, just a thought around that um, for your own edification. Um, we were in a mixed model here in Utah. We had all three forms of payment coming into our practices and into our facilities, into our hospitals. And so the question came up, okay, how badly am I hurt on fee-for-service on per case payment if we do these sorts of things, how much do I gain for the areas where I'm at risk? It's the red triangles versus the green triangles argument, you see. I build a fairly robust mathematical model, and this slide attempts to show the results. It depends on something called your variable cost rate. At the time, Intermountains was about 50-50, the red line. It turns out that if I was at risk for about that red line crossing the axis, 23% of my care, that I received more operating margin from using waste elimination care management methods than I lost on my fee-for-service or per-case payment methods, 23%. It seems surprisingly low. Um, it made sense, though. A quick story just to illustrate what I really mean. Um, it happened at our largest academic teaching hospital in Mountain Medical Center. It was Don LePay, the chief of cardiology. He oversaw the cath lab. Uh, five major things happened in that cath lab. Number one was diagnostic catheterization of the heart. Number two, stenting to open blood flow within the coronary vasculature. Number three, uh, permanent pacemaker implantation, number four, pacemaker slash defibrillators, defibrillator implantation, number five, nuclear stress test system maybe. Uh, well, 
We knew it was a complexity problem. Uh, we were among the lowest use rates in the United States of America in the bottom quintile, the bottom fifth of the United States in terms of population adjusted use rates. What Don did was take the American College of Cardiology guidelines for appropriate care for each of those five and reduced them to a single sheet of paper. It was a checklist, really, of a single sheet of paper. Um, they ranged from 40 to 90 factors per sheet. Well, on some of them, it took both sides of that sheet of paper, frankly. He then used some leverage and some moral suasion to get his colleagues to just check the sheet before they took a patient to the cath lab. What he was really trying to do was get the evidence in front of them when they were making a decision as they counseled with the patient. That was his whole purpose. Just get the evidence in front of them, you see. Um, we watched our use rates fall by 22%. We were tracking long-term outcomes. We already had a robust long-term outcome tracking system in place. Our clinical outcomes improved slightly. What we learned was is that we were exposing some patients to risk Without a, a concomitant counterbalancing benefit, it was sobering, it was humbling, to say the least. We thought we were pretty hot, pretty good. Compared to our peers, we were. But compared to what our patients need, we weren't. Um, about $19 million per year in variable cost savings, about $40 million per year in total cost savings. Well, think of it this way. If I do the case, I have all that resource expenditure, but I probably get paid a little bit more than I consumed. I'll have an operating margin, and I make that little margin. What happens if I eliminate the whole case? I don't get 5 to 9%. In savings, I get 100% through better care. That is why this number is so low. Uh, I did it for different levels of fixed costs. Most universities say they're at 65%. There you need about 29% to be at the tipping point. Um, our strategic vice president for planning, Greg Polson, said that we really should use 35% if we treat nursing staff as a variable cost, which arguably we should. Um, then it was only down at uh, 19%. Well, how do I think about that? What does that risk mean? We realized that we provided health insurance to our employees and their families. Most health insurance in our states is funded through the place where you work, at least for commercial age populations. We had a fair bit of uncompensated care. People we called self-pay that had no insurance, uh, had no real payment ability. That was really capitated care with a 0% capitation rate, but the big one, this was a really interesting one out here, number four. Uh, at the time, the federal government paid us 82 cents on the dollar of our true cost for care for the cases they sent to us, the Medicare program. Remember, we had that activity-based costing system. We could measure it very accurately. But it wasn't uniform. For some things we did for government-funded cases, they were paying us 120% of our costs. For others, it was done around 45. Well, the shortfall, the shortfall on a case-by-case -case basis between our true cost of operations and what we were paid function like capitation. We were at risk and at a much higher level of risk than we had anticipated, than we thought we knew. In fact, we decided that we were about 40% at risk, well beyond our tipping point. You see the idea. Well, you can carry it a step further. Um, think of finding initial targets where you start to move in to pay for value strategies. You perform that key process analysis, but we would call that here in the United States is you build within a payer mix analysis. So by clinical condition, you say, who pays me what? How does it compare? Why am I doing it that way? Well, you need complete clinical areas. You can't go in and ask a practice group to do some patients one way, some patients another. It's operationally extremely difficult, and frankly, uh, it's unethical. But what we discovered is, is we had a whole series of clinical areas where we were already so far underwater that it made perfect sense to do it right now today, even if our payment mechanisms were not changed. Now, I will admit this is an analytic problem. You'll need to have fairly robust analysis. Uh, frankly, when I do it, I usually get health catalysts to help me. 
because they're pretty good at that. And uh, I used to do it myself, but you know how that goes, guys, as you get older. Well, with that, I'm ready to wrap up. It's time we have some Q&A, just a couple of other ideas. What does the future hold? I think in the future, all of us around the free world are going to see increasing focus on waste elimination. The argument for it's just too compelling as a means of getting better services to more people at a higher level of quality of care. Most care delivery organizations will probably start to see capitated risk in some form or another. I'm not sure exactly how it will play out. Um, just as one example, um, I'm working as a, a consultant to the Ministry of Health in Singapore. Uh, we've been going through these arguments, and I believe that Singapore is about to shift to population health, a.k.a. pay for value, a.k.a. provider at financial risk. Uh, they plan to shift their whole health system into these models. It's a compelling argument when you really dig into it. More than that, we know that it works. We've got hard data that it really works. I think it's just a matter of time for anybody. Uh, frankly, um, you'll not be able to survive compared to those who can manage at a clinical process level. If you rely on traditional methods, you're signing your own death warrant as a care delivery group. Is what I believe will happen around the world. It'll get easier with time. We'll see many more people doing that services to support it. We'll get much better. But I think very clearly this is part of the future of the healing professions in the healthcare industry around the free world. I found this great cartoon. This is your wake-up call. Change or die. Um, does it ever apply to this particular area? With that, I'm going to quit. Thanks for your attention. You very quietly let me just run on for an hour, a little bit more. Um, but uh, Farana, Sarah, sorry, do yes. we have questions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. James. So we'd like to open up to questions. Are there any questions from the audience? You're welcome to um, raise your hand or chat it into, uh, put it into the chat group. Ahana, it's Peter Kennedy. I'd just like to thank Brent for what was a brilliant uh, presentation of the business case for quality. You won't ever see it better presented. And the question I have for Brent is that you were intimating about value-based care in some of your statements there. Could you just expand upon where you see this going? What's happening in the US and how should we be moving towards um, getting using that information you supplied to provide value-based care? So what's happening to us, Peter, uh, here, um, it's, a, it's politically strange. You're familiar with what's going on politically in the US these days. started with the George W. Bush administration uh, back when uh, Michael Levitt, governor of Utah originally, that was running HHS, the federal Medicare system. They started to make changes that directly drove into pay for value, trying to shift the system. Uh, one major form of it's called Medicare Advantage. Uh, when Obama, President Obama, took over the White House, uh, installed a, a new oversight department, they continued it. In fact, they doubled down. A good friend, Don Berwick, was running the Medicare program. It was CMMI, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations, and this was a, a major area of focus. Trump administration continued the same program. Now, that's amazing. But now with Joe Biden taking over the White House, they're pushing it even harder. So what I'm seeing is over the last almost 20 years, continued pressure in this direction. It's produced some fascinating organizations. Uh, ChenMed, privately run healthcare system, expanding dramatically, 30 to 50 percent annual growth rate. They're a primary care group that's expanding across many different communities. They use a concierge model with a clinical team led by a physician, nurses, other help, concierge model for Medicare patients, but they insist on capitated payment. And the way that they're doing well, that Chris Chen, um, his father started it. He's a cardiologist, by the way, but the way Chris, he's doing really well with this. Chen Med's doing quite well and expanding rapidly. They insist on capitation and they make their money by keeping people out of the hospital. I, I gave you a couple of examples and boy, you watch that. I, I'm also working with Kaiser Permanente. They've had this model for a long time and suddenly they're finding that they're in a really good place. Um, Pat Cornia, their CMO, he just retired. 
was telling me that they've expanded from a, a $70 billion care delivery group to a $90 billion care delivery group over four years, just four years, by applying value-based care. So what usually happens, it's funny, people in the United States really resist it. They don't have much experience with pay for value, especially this capitated payment, how you set a fair rate. But the scary part is, is if somebody else sneaks in and starts to do it in your community, because they'll eat your lunch. Uh, I was talking to a hospital in Northern California. We we're going up against Kaiser, and they were in deep, deep trouble around this one because they'd let it go too long. What I'm saying, Peter, is you don't want to be the second one to the game. You want to understand this well enough that you don't get blindsided, you don't get tricked, you don't get hoodwinked along the way, and you have to learn the methods. Now, the methods are classic quality improvement. It's something you should be doing anyway as a caring professional. And of course, all of us are interested in better care for our patients. Well, do it the way that saves a ton of money at the same time. Figure out the finances so that you can get your fair share of that. Now, even if your government paid it, I first saw it up in British Columbia in Canada. It was a hospital operator, an administrator running the hospital in Vancouver. He ran three big clinical projects, and they were just plain pretty. I mean, wow, he did a good job. Darn impressive. Uh, better clinical outcomes, but he took about 3 or $4 million out of his hospital. Well, what happened to him? Um, his political overseers in that system, took his savings, pulled them out, adjusted his budgets down, took them away permanently, and gave them to the other hospitals in his area that were running over budget. And it's interesting what he told me. He said, I'll never do this again. What I would recommend to you is if you start to pursue these strategies, have the conversation in advance with those who control the budgets. Uh, and the same principles kind of apply. Do the analytics. Figure it out. And before you launch it, um, set up a plan. Come to some agreed-upon standards, uh, agreed-upon meet points, road marks that you're going to hit. And make sure that you are financially protected, regardless of how you, you're paid along the way. If that makes sense, that would be my advice. It's an analytics problem, but you can do it. So Dr. James, there's a few questions coming in. I'm just going to go by order that, that they've come in. Um, one has come from uh, uh, Kevin Sam. Um, this was a brilliant presentation. The question I have is advice on how we uh, might prioritize our activities so the system benefits sooner rather than trying to solve all problems at once. Oh, really good question. So technically in the theory, Kevin, it's called key process analysis. Um, an illustration uh, way back, I, I did the analysis personally myself for Intermountain. Uh, I could identify a little over 1,450, I think it's 1,453 clinical conditions. It's actually patient-centered care. It's what brought patients in to see us. They had a problem. And I thought of them as clinical processes of care. It's when we were writing uh, Crossing the Quality Chasm Report at IOM, we popularized the term patient-centered care. And this is a big part of what we meant. You don't organize around the physicians, you organize around the patients, which means the problems they bring to us, these clinical processes, 1,453. We stacked them up based on how many patients were affected, health risk to the patient, and internal variability. I had two others I couldn't measure. One was justice and equity. Um, then we wanted everybody to be able to be in the game. Uh, those were judgment calls. Well, the funny thing, 104 processes out of 1,453, 7% of the processes accounted for 95% of all of our care delivery. Just if I can make it more real, the single biggest process we executed inside Intermountain was pregnancy, labor, and delivery. We delivered about 34,000 babies each year. It was 11% of our total system volume by itself. Now, Utah may be unique in that. Um, on the other hand, number two is ischemic heart disease, management of ischemic heart disease. It's chest pain rollout MI in the ED. It was a two coronary syndrome bypass graph. That was another 10%. And so what we did is, is, is that we started on the big guys where we got very high leverage. 
that first year, um, strategically, I said, let's see what we can put together for pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Let's see what we can do for management of ischemic heart disease. And, and you might be surprised how big pregnancy, labor, and delivery is for you. You would just have to run the analysis. But ischemic heart disease is going to be up close to the top of your stack, I pretty much guarantee. But do the analysis. Now, the trick that we learned later, a very useful trick, uh, as long as we're talking finances, figure out where you're underwater. <laughs> you will need the ability to estimate your true cost of care. Um, I had that activity-based costing system. Um, frankly, Catalyst has something called Chorus, which allows you to use an EMR and estimate true cost of care pretty accurately. You may already have a tool. Uh, there are two or three others floating around out there that you could use. Um, but if you figure out where you're way underwater, it's, it seems to me it's perfectly legitimate to pick areas where you're first learning that you'll drop in on and start to do full care management, pick the areas where regardless of how you're paid, you're likely to be in a much better financial position. Improve that care and those outcomes, you see, and use it as a learning case. You know, one of the, the main pushbacks I get from system leaders here in the United States, they said, well, it feels like I got one foot on the dock and one foot in the canoe. You know, it feels really unstable. The alternative, of course, is, well, you want me to kind of cannonball into the deep end of the pool when I don't know how to swim. Well, no. What if instead of doing that, you carved off areas where it made sense right now and learned by doing in areas where it currently makes sense? Now, that's going to take some analytics, but they're straightforward um, and doable. Um uh, it means you don't have to cannonball into the deep end of the pool. Uh, it means you can learn by doing in ways that will benefit you right now today. All right. And okay. that's what I would recommend, Kevin. Great. Thanks, Dr. James. Next question is, what are the key enablers for introducing a provider at risk funding system? Well, I've just talked about one. Pick areas where you'll be ahead. The other key enabler, you have to be able to risk adjust well. Well, two pieces. Here in this country, I probably, I don't know. Given the way Australian healthcare, if it still works the same, you probably have pretty good actuarial analysis to figure out how much healthcare resources a particular population should concern, uh, con consume. We use that to set insurance rates. And I suspect you're already doing that fairly well, but that's the first piece, it's just actuarial. Then um, there are two factors at play. We learned this during the HMO era. One is cherry picking healthy patients. And the other is it's called lemon dropping, cherry picking and lemon dropping. Sick patients, you try to do things in your design to force them out of your practices and you get both bad behaviors. If you have a decent risk adjustment system, then neither of those approaches make sense. It's mostly based around identifying major chronic diseases and their um, degree of severity within major chronic diseases. And if you have that, you're going to get a capitated rate that you will not want to turn away any patients. By the way, it changes your whole structure. I mean, it means that you really can focus on the best health of a patient. It's going to align your finances to your, your professional values. And when that happens, it really is sweet. I mean, the, you're practicing the best most eth ethical medicine. So, so Chris Chen at ChenMed, he uses a concierge model where he has uh, enough staff that every patient has direct access to a care provider because he wants them healthy. He does not want them in the ED. He does not want them in the hospital. He wants them to be getting perfect care every time. And the way you do that is move upstream and manage really, really well before you get into trouble. Works for the patient, works for the finances, works for the practice. Um, but yeah, actuarial analysis is a key enabler. Good risk adjustment is a key enabler. And well, then of course, classic quality improvement, clinical management. You need to be able to actually manage the care. Um, and I'm giving you the names of some good organizations where you can go and see it kind of working, assuming that you can get in to see them. Okay, so I'm just going by time. So when people ask the question, so in order, 
Um, so this next question is from G. Kelly. Great talk. My question is this, how do we convince people that a move to value-based care is needed when traditional methods, the craft of medicine still continue to work and we continue to see gains in morbidity, mortality, et cetera. For example, in pediatric ICU, we're not good at managing complexity and standardizing care, yet even in the last decade, we have had further improvements in survival and quality of survival. Yeah. Um, so this is my personal preference. This is how I would do it. Based on long experience, you may come up with a better solution for yourself. I like to carve off small areas, uh, get good data around them uh, so that you can make a compelling case and then kind of hold it up for everybody to see. Uh, and when I say good data, I need good clinical outcomes data and good cost data side by side. It turns out that most human beings are pretty concrete thinkers. And they have to kind of see the little machine working and the little wheels turning and then they go, oh, I, I get that. And then, then they become um, massively creative, some of them, and wow, they do cool stuff when that happens. But what I would be doing was trying to find a few areas. Oh, you're probably familiar with Roger's classic text, The Fusion of Innovation. He claimed to describe any movement of a new idea across a group. Um, and you always start with innovators and early adopters. The key factor is engagement. So find an area where you have some engaged clinicians who really want to deliver best care. Probably won't be everybody. Go work with the uh, the early adopters, the ones who are fully engaged. It, by the way, it should be fun. It should be a blast. It should be great fun. If it's not fun, you're not doing it right. And then use those to learn and to show so that you can hold them up. You'll get two things. You'll have the data you're creating, but you'll also have that word of mouth for the people who are involved in it. Talking it up, talking about how it feels and then use those things, and he'd say next you go from the early adopters to the early majority, then to the late majority, and then it just becomes the way that you do business across the care system. I personally believe I've never had much success with top-down mandates out of the senior leadership of a health system or especially coming out of government. Good luck with that one. On the other hand, when you get fully engaged people down at the front line, being real physicians, real nurses, I've seen that fairly routinely produce dramatic improvements, and it's fun. All right. So the next question comes from Kylie Stark. Are we setting up our new graduate clinicians for success by teaching the stuff at our tertiary institutions? Are they entering a world that is familiar? Great talk. Thank you. I think I think that she answered. There wasn't really a question in there. She was making a statement. At least that's what I heard. Um, I know that we. I, I haven't been in Australia for too long, and so I haven't seen the training systems. But I know that here in the United States, so uh, you know everybody in theory teaches quality improvement. I believe that we could do a much much better job of it. Let's just say. Um, so, I'll let you make your own judgments on that. All right, next question from Matt O'Meara. Our local definition of value in, includes patient and clinician experience. While you describe patient outcome and drivers for clinician behavior, how are you including those aspects of value in your evaluations? So um, in Deming's core theory, every process produces three classes of outcomes. The first, he called a physical outcome for us, it'd be a clinical outcome. The second is a a satisfaction outcome, an experience outcome, service quality, right? And, and that's what you were talking about, about clinician experience and patient experience. Then he treated cost as an outcome. They all three go together. What he did next, though, um, he basically explored the links between cost and quality, clinical quality and cost, and he defined a series of hard causal links. So cost and quality are very tightly linked. All right, you really can't do one without the other. I would make the argument though, and I, I think I could do it fairly well, given enough time, we don't have that time, that service quality is almost completely independent. Uh, it lives in its own little world, you've seen it, where somebody has a very positive experience of their clinicians, and when you sit back as a professional and evaluate the quality of the care they received, it's absolute crap. I mean, it's, it's just something that really shouldn't be tolerated. You've seen it. We all have. On the other hand, you've seen truly excellent care. 
um, truly outstanding clinical quality and the patient experience is quite poor. Uh, because of that, while there are ways that they do interact, they tend to be indirect and subtle. And so I tend to think of service quality in a separate bucket, but you hinted at something. You pointed out that it's not just the patient experience of care, it's the professional team's experience of care. So the people who've been writing about this, the best book on it, well, I happen to have it right here. Just happen to have it sitting here. This is uh, Steve Swentz and Tate Shanafelt when they were both at Mayo Clinic, Strategies to Reduce Burnout, 12 Actions to Create the Ideal Workplace. Here's how I'd ask it. There's this one factor. Uh, it turns out it's associated with a two- to five-fold increase in productivity of the workforce. It's a direct driver of patient experience of care. In fact, arguably, it's the most important driver of patient experience of care along the way. It's directly associated, strongly associated with better quality and patient safety. What is it? it turns out it's workforce engagement. And that's what Tate and Steve are really talking about in this book is how do you fully engage the physicians, the nurses, the therapists, the technicians, the housekeepers, everyone who delivers the care. There's a science to it. Um, and it's a very high leverage factor. And I recommend it to you quite heavily, this idea of engagement. Um, it will largely determine your patient's experience of care completely independent of their technical quality. Of course, the trick is it's also strongly associated with high quality, safe care when you have a fully engaged workforce at the same time. So some studies show a link and association between the two patient satisfaction and quality of care, but it turns out it's a cofactor off to the side that's driving it. They drive bold. It's this idea of patient engagement. I didn't really cover it. Um, yeah, Stephen Tate's book's a pretty good starting point. Uh, one of the real masters was a woman named Jill Green. Now, truth in advertising, she was a nurse at LDS Hospital when I first came to Salt Lake, just moving into administration. She used workforce engagement to turn around Mission Health in North Carolina a massive financial success. It was failing financially. She turned it around. She was COO, chief operating officer there. She's now the CEO of Queen's Health System in Honolulu. Um, and she's a master at using engagement to drive a business plan. And, and it just happens that it's very, very strongly associated with great patient experience of care. All right, so I know we're at the top of the hour. There's a few more questions. I'm not sure if we have time for those or um, Kari, do you want to have some The book is comments? Strategies to Reduce Burnout, 12 Actions to Create an Ideal Workplace. Steve Swenson, S-W-E-N-S-E-N, -E -E and Tate Shanafelt, S-H-A-N-A-F-E-L-T. Um, uh, Tate is the current Chief Wellness Officer at Stanford, where I have my current major, they actually pay me academic appointment, by the way, in the Department of Medicine. So, yeah, Shanna Felton, Clemson. Sorry, okay. sorry for that. Ron, no, I just no saw worries. the question in chat. No, no, no problem. So, Kari? For Hannah, if, if but there's a couple of questions to come and colleagues, I still see we've got quite a few colleagues on the line. We can add another five, ten minutes. I'm sure people would love to hear from Brent and just get a response sure. to it. The, the, the kind of thoughts you've been stimulating for the last hour, Brent. So um, why don't we go through what's left for Hannah? Sure, no worries. All right, so the next question is, um, I find the concept, this is from Gary Disher. I find the concept of savings in healthcare to be a misnomer. We avoid costs when we introduce efficiencies as there's always the pressure of the next patient and the next to absorb the funding we have. Like your example, Dr. James, if political masters see savings, it will be quickly removed. We read too many research papers. Do we read that fine savings can be made? Yeah. Uh, so that's part of the art of it, Gary, right there. Um, I've learned that lesson the hard way, frankly. Um, you know, it teaches you to be much more sophisticated in your financial analysis and also in your setup to these things. Um, I like to do it on a small scale where you can actually show the principles working because it tends to be convincing to all. 
And many times, if you're clever about it, if you're thoughtful about it, you can arrange the finances in advance so it really does work out and then build from there. Uh, but you're right, especially in the public system in, I mean, when I say public, the government-funded system in Australia, I know that you have a private system as well. Uh, you have parallel systems. You'd have to have uh, leadership that understands these principles and is willing to help with it. And if they're not, um, oh, I still recommend it to you, but you'd be much more selective in the areas that you attacked. If you do that, pair mix adjusted key process analysis, you'll discover that there are ways that you can slip it under the radar and you'll still do better financially <laughs> as you learn the principles and demonstrate it to others. Again, it's a bit of an analytic problem. Um, just in passing, when I first showed up at Intermountain, um, I had no particular management support. I, I had people who were truly dedicated to mission, though. Truly dedicated to mission, and the, the, they, they saw cost as a problem, but it's mostly because it limited patients' access to our service. And what we eventually realized is if we if we got our our care right, it would get our costs down, and we could use the same resource to serve a much larger group of patients. I imagine that you already face some challenges where the politicians are concerned about access to care, waiting lists, for example, uh, full beds. Um, maybe if we pitched it to them right in terms of the things that we did, giving fuller access, maybe they'll keep their, their hands off our budgets. Maybe if we showed it to them clearly enough that they could see the mechanisms by which it worked, they would come to demand that of the other hospitals in my state, not just me. You see what I mean? I mean, one of the things you learn is you have to maintain very, very good uh, communications and relationships, both data and word of mouth, and that it can be done. Um, it can be done. So, thanks for the question, Gary. That's a really good one, and yeah, that'd be that'd be a topic worthy of a lot further discussion. But it can be done. Right. Okay, so I think that's actually the last question because the other one was for you to share the name of the book, which I think you already have. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Kari, oh, is there another question? No? Okay, so Kari, would you like to say a few words and then I'll just wrap up? Thank you, Farhana. Um, from, I'll talk on behalf of Peter Kennedy and myself as we, we arrange this as a kind of joint hosting from eHealth and the Clinical Excellence Commission. Um, as, as always, Brent, a fantastic presentation and um, I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of the afternoon energised, inspired. It took me, back, took me back to our earlier discussions with you, but you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, our discussions at the moment about value-based care about the need to create a powerful partnership between the clinical and the financial communities um, is one we are really on a tipping point for. Um, we've got a lot of um, commitment in the state. And I think what you've given us today is a lot of ways to think how we could leverage that um, and work with um, our communities of practice across all of our clinical specialties. So. Thank you for your time. We're privileged. I know your time is precious and we've thoroughly enjoyed it and we have recorded it. Um, so colleagues can go back and listen and, and have a bit more time to think through what you've shared with us today. Um, but thank you again. And I hope when the travel bubbles open, we might see you in Australia in due course. <laughs> I got to tell you, Kari, just how much I respect my colleagues in Australia. When I was down, some of the best quality work I've ever seen. Um, you're good at what you do, and um, I'm just, I'm just, I feel privileged that we're on this journey together. So let's go show the world what we can really do. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, for Hannah. Thanks very much. And you know, again, as uh, Kari mentioned, we have recorded today's session, uh, and you'll receive an email with links to that recording and the presentation slides. Um, if you'd like to have any further discuss discussions with Dr. James, please reach out to me and we'd be happy to arrange that. And on behalf of Dr. James and all of us here at Health Catalyst, thank you for joining us today.